All right. Hi, Founder fans. Welcome to Founder of the Day Week in Review, where we're going to be discussing the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven articles published on my website, founderoftheday.com. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you're ready to enjoy learning about some founders. You may have already read the articles as they've already been published, and you're just here to learn a little bit more, or you have not, and you're here to learn a whole bunch of new stuff. And boy, do we have some extraordinarily fun American founders for you today. Uh, let's pop over here where we will bring up our first founder. And again, unless you're new here, uh, you might, if, let me say that again, if you are new here, you might not know this. If you are not new here, you will know that every Friday I publish right now about an anti-federalist paper. Now, this week is the first week we are discussing the impartial examiner, which I gave a little prelude last week, but just to recap, the impartial examiner uh, is, uh, and you know what, let me hit this record button right here. So the first impartial examiner, the impartial examiner was an anonymous anti-federalist printer, or I should say article writer in Virginia. And we still don't know who wrote the impartial examiner essays, but let's talk about the first one, shall we? It was published in February of 1788, just as Virginia is getting ready to go do some ratification conventioning. Now, I will say several states had already ratified the Constitution at this point, but you know, a big powerful state like Virginia voting against ratification could have hurt the Constitution's approval at large, and it may have essentially gone up in smoke, as they say. So, with the impartial examiner, the first one, I, I will note, they are rather lengthy. Having already reviewed all of the Federalist Papers and reviewed the essays of Brutus, those are fairly standard newspaper article lengths, but the impartial examiners are very long. So this is a very, very, very brief assessment of what it says in the impartial examiner one. And we'll, the first thing he really attacks is the idea of an arbitrary government versus a free government. Now, when the examiner discusses arbitrary government, he doesn't exactly use the word arbitrary like we might think of it today. He uses the word arbitrary to essentially describe an authoritarian government, uh, a king or, or a dictator, uh, not necessarily with the tyrannical overtones, but just the idea that there's one person in charge or a few handful of people in charge who have absolutely nothing to do with the people themselves. They can make whatever laws they want arbitrarily if they choose, though usually it, they're not done for those arbitrary reasons, but essentially that's what he means by arbitrary. And the opposite of an arbitrary government, according to the examiner, is a free government, aka what they were referring to as a Republican government, uh, one that works directly for the people themselves. Now, I will say the independent examiner notes that when a government is created, governments are natural, and when they are created, there is a certain agreement between the people of a society to give up certain basic rights for the betterment of the whole. Or, or in other words, to secure the liberties of each individual, each individual has to give up a little bit of their independence to form the government itself. Now, that being said, the Independent Examiner goes really into depth in the idea that this whole new constitution is being done way too hastily. First of all, the, the this is less this is like five years after the revolution had ceased hostilities. So the American people had just overthrown a government, thrown off a government, and instituted a new one. Now, well, everyone, including the Independent Examiner, acknowledges that the Articles of Confederation had certain major flaws that needed correcting. It also notes that I we can revise the current government instead of just overthrowing the old one. Uh, it seems a little hasty to be five years after getting rid of one government, putting in another one. And furthermore, why do we have to ratify this constitution so quickly? Why has it been, it's been about four months since the constitution has been pre prevent, presented to the people for ratification, and we have to do it right now? Why can't we take two or three years, really talk about it, maybe make some changes beforehand instead of hoping that we make amendments afterwards. Now, of course, they do make amendments. The Bill of Rights they make within a handful of years just after the new government takes hold. But again, at the time, there was no way for the independent examiner or anyone else in the colonies to know this. So there was a good amount of fear in that regard. The impartial examiner then goes to, on to discuss the rights themselves. 
uh, he spends most of this paper really talking about the lack of a Bill of Rights and the need for a Bill of Rights. First of all, he notes that if rights are not expressly reserved, I'm going to quote it, expre expressly reserved in a government's constitution, then you could safely assume they are not protected and will be removed. And that is essentially what uh, the impartial examiner in this first paper is most concerned about is that, hey, we have this government. It, it, it doesn't say we have freedom of speech, so they can just get rid of our rights to free press. They can get rid of our rights to free speech. They can get rid of our rights to a fair and just trial because it is not explicitly expli expressly reserved in the Constitution. He then goes on to talk about Article 6 of the Constitution. He notes, I know, he, the independent examiner even says, I know I'm jumping ahead a bit here, but he, he talks about Article 6 of the Constitution because that's where they have the supremacy clause. And one of the arguments the Federalists were making for why there wasn't a Bill of Rights is the states already have the Bill of Rights. And essentially echoing what we've discussed about in the essays of Brutus, another anti-Federalist paper, the impartial examiner says, hey, the supremacy clause is going to be used to make the federal government more powerful than the state governments, therefore making certain parts of the state governments, aka their bills of rights, totally unimportant. Therefore, the federal government will accumulate power and essentially dissolve the states altogether. Now, he does actually at this point reference the uh, Federalist Papers, which he he refers to Hamilton's one of Hamilton's papers uh, as he said he calls him a a zealous advocate in a northern state, and I thought that was very funny. Uh, again, when he was talking about the Bill of Rights, and Hamilton in the Federalist Papers argues against the need for a Bill of Rights in the Constitution in the Federalist Papers, uh, and uh, the impartial examiner is very directly attacking that. Again, this is in Virginia, the most powerful state just on the eve of their ratification convention, doing it, doing their best to try and halt Virginia's participation in the Union. And very closely so, Virginia would go on to only have a 10-vote divide when they finally voted. So that is a very, very, very brief overview of the impartial examiner's first essay. I hope you enjoyed that. I am going to pull up my chair. Nope, all the way up. Never mind. Make fun of me. Anyway, uh, Misfit, how's it going? Uh, so the Jersey militia reenactors are firing at French ships with muskets. Right now? <laughs> um, um, I'm a little... Is today an anniversary of something that I'm not recalling properly? If it is, I do apologize. And if I'm a little loud, I do apologize too. Looks like I'm peeking out on here. I'm going to turn this down just a bit. We're going to bounce over to our next American founder. Elias Budina. Okie dokie. Let's back up here and let's get on with it. Elias Budino, whose name I believe I am pronouncing correctly. I don't think it's Elias Budinot. I believe it's Elias Budino. If I am mispronouncing it, have at me in the comments. I appreciate it. Now, Elias Budino is one of those major American founders who we just very rarely hear much about. Now, he was from New Jersey. Uh, he decided to jump in with the Patriot cause and was very quickly elected to the Provincial Assembly in 1775. Like, right as things start getting hostile, he is one of the people uh, put in charge. He really focuses on recruiting soldiers from New Jersey to join the militia and the Continental Army and paying for supplies. And his efforts are immediately noticed by George Washington. Uh, the two correspond very frequently, and he... Boudinot takes over as Commissary General for Prisoners. Now, Commissary General for Prisoners is a really interesting position. Technically a general in the Continental Army, though a very low-level general, because he doesn't lead any men. He has a team, but a very small one. And their goal is twofold. First of all, they need to take care of British prisoners in American custody, feeding and clothing them. And I'll remind you that the Americans were trying to prove that they were better than the British. Uh, and the main way they were trying to do this was to take care of their prisoners, especially the German Hessian soldiers that were taken prisoner. They really wanted to not only convince them they were better, but uh, they wanted them to move to America to help populate the lands they were about to win, according to them. 
So he was supposed to feed and clothe and take care of all the, the uh, British and German prisoners. But additionally, he was responsible for taking care of the American prisoners in British custody. And this is fascinating because famously the British did not take very good care of their American prisoners. But Boudinot was supposed to collect supplies for the American prisoners and get it across British lines and just kind of hope that the British would give it to the prisoners, which they kind of did, but kind of didn't. Uh, either way, a very pre precious circumstance that Boudinot found himself in dealing with the British, who were the enemy, trying to help each other's soldiers. Uh, he wasn't directly involved with prisoner exchanges, but his role in taking care of all the prisoners uh, made him very important when it came to selecting prisoners to be exchanged. So he does this for several years, um, but he actually resigns after, at, at a certain point because he, New Jersey elects him to go to the Continental Congress. And Boudinot realizes he can actually do more to help not just the prisoners, but the war itself and the new nation if he has what he sees as a higher position. Now, I will also note most people didn't view the Continental Congress as a higher position. Once independence was declared, you see most of the big names leaving the Constitutional Convention, uh, I'm sorry, leaving the Continental Congress and going back to their home states where they thought they could do more work. Who knows one of the few who realizes he could do more work on the national stage uh, at the Continental Congress. So he goes, he's there, and in 1782, he is elected as president of the Continental Congress. I will remind you being president of the Continental Congress is not being president of the United States of America. You were essentially chairman overseeing the discussions of the Continental Congress. However, as president, the one honor that you were granted is it was your responsibility to sign any official documentation on behalf of the United States of America. And in 1783, on April 15th, 1783, Elias Boudinot is president of the Continental Congress when Congress ratifies the Preliminary Articles of Peace. Now, the Preliminary Articles of Peace were what John Adams, John Jay, and Ben Franklin had sent back to the United States saying, here, we've agreed to end the war. We just need you guys to sign these Preliminary Articles of Peace. We can end all hostilities and then finally sign the Treaty of Paris. So Elias Boudinot, as president of the Continental Congress, is the one who put his signature on the preliminary articles of peace. He sent it back to Europe, where the war would be ended, and he sent it over to George Washington, who days later announced the end of hostilities. And although there would still be a few skirmishes, mostly out west with the Native Americans, Elias Boudinot putting his signature on that document essentially ends the violence that was the American Revolutionary War. Now, I also want to note, uh, Boudinot, after this, he's elected as an inaugural member of the United States House of Representatives and serves for the, through the first three terms. He, at that point, declines to run for office. Again, he's grown old at this point, but he's shortly thereafter appointed by George Washington of, as director of the United States Mint, and he is in charge of creating the money for the new United States government under the Constitution. And he holds this position not only through the end of the Washington administration, but through the John Adams administration and the Thomas Jefferson administration. And these were politically divided times, but as it speaks a lot to Elias Boudinot's character and the work he did that both parties would continue him in that position of running, creating the money for the young United States. So that is a brief overview of the life of Elias Boudinot. Take a quick sip of my water. I have a bottle this time. Please don't judge me for my carbon crimes. Um, let's move right along here. We're doing a good job. We're having a fun time. John Hart, not De Hart. I know we run into some De Hart sometimes when we're playing trivia, but this is John Hart. John Hart was a miller, an artisan, but he had made such a name for himself in his community. Oh, let me, oh, sorry. John Hart was a miller in New Jersey. And by the time the Revolutionary War breaks out, John Hart had made such a name for himself among his peers that he was actually selected for the Provincial Congress, the Revolutionary Congress. And he was thought highly enough of to be chosen as the first vice president, despite not being a lawyer or a merchant or one of the high class positions. 
He was just considered an honor honorable citizen, that public virtue that the founders respected so mightily. Additionally, at this time, he sits on the New Jersey Committee of Safety, which oversaw the war and the militia, and the Committee of Correspondence, which kept in touch with the other colonies. It really makes him one of the most powerful men in early revolutionary New Jersey. Now, by this point, he was already a real pretty old guy, already in his mid-60s, but when it becomes clear independence is going to be voted on, several of the colonies decide to recall their more hesitant delegates to the Continental Congress and replace them with more radical members that they thought would vote for independence. John Hart was one of these radical people that New Jersey sent to replace more conservative members of the Continental Congress. They sent John Hart knowing he was in favor of independence. He goes and votes for independence, and then he signs the Declaration of Independence. After this, as, as we've said before, uh, he is one of the many Continental Congressmen who see independence happen and say, I got to go do something important. And they leave the Continental Congress and go back to their home states because that's where the hard work was thought to be done. Hart goes back to the to New Jersey. He is almost immediately chosen as Speaker of the New Jersey General Assembly under New Jersey's new constitution. And he is really, uh, of all the many things he does, uh, he, he assists in the war effort primarily. He helps raise money, helps secure people. And then in December of 1776, the British are coming. They come storming through New Jersey, and many patriots have to run away, including John Hart, who runs away and actually hides in a cave. John Hart spends several days in a cave, though luckily, just about a week and a half later, George Washington comes back into New Jersey, crosses the Delaware, which is pretty famous, you may have heard of it, and he retakes Trenton, scares the British and the Hessians out of the area, and John Hart is able to leave his new cave house and go back to his regular home. Now, it's interesting that he does go to his regular home, because just a year and a half later, well, Hart returns the favor to George Washington because George Washington needs a place to camp out for a little bit. And it's at John Hart's house that he spends a few days camping 12,000 soldiers on John Hart's property. Now, sadly for John Hart, he passes away not long after this of what they called gravel, which we now call kidney stones. Which it's interesting that like stones, gravel, how that linguistic change was made. Now that's not important, I just find that interesting. But... As I said, he passes away, and this is about two years before the actual war ends. So John Hart does not actually get to see the independence achieved for the nation who he helped drive towards that independence and, in fact, sign the Declaration of Independence for. So that is a grave, gravely short review of the life of John Hart, Declaration Signer and Cave Dweller. It's a pretty quick one. There's not a whole lot on John Hart. <laughs> His story, his story comes and goes <laughs> pretty quickly. I do hope you guys are enjoying. Thank you so much for coming. If you want to hit like, I would really appreciate that. Um, let's see. Who is next? Stephen Higginson. All right. Don't know why. I always want to say Higgins. That's not it. There's a son at the end there. All right. When the American Revolutionary War broke out, Stephen Higginson was one of the wealthiest men in Virginia. In fact, he had, uh, let me say that again. He was one of the wealthiest men in Massachusetts. In fact, he has a lot in common with John Hancock. Now, even before the war itself breaks out in 1771, Higginson is actually sent to London to speak. He testifies before Parliament to discuss why the people of Boston are so unhappy, why the colonists are so resistant to the taxation, why they're so upset about impressment of uh, uh, sailors into the Navy and why they're so unhappy that there are the British Army, a standing army in Massachusetts. Now, this doesn't go very well and he returns to Massachusetts uh, radicalized and he joins the Patriot cause and very quickly becomes a leader of the American cause in Massachusetts. Now, as the hostilities emerge, uh, Higginson uses his power as a merchant to outfit his ships as privateers. So not only does he help attack British ships at sea, he also makes a great deal of money off of those attacks, much like John Hancock. He, also like Hancock, uh, Higginson is sent to the Continental Congress. He spends four years in the Continental Congress and is there when the they oversee the ratification of the Treaty of Paris and ending the Revolutionary War. Now, Higginson goes back to Massachusetts. He becomes a member of the Quorum. 
as it's called. And the quorum is 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 a judicial body in Massachusetts. It's it's like a lower Supreme Court, uh, and it's made up of wealthy, respectable members of society. But he's not there very long. He actually gets replaced by John Hancock. And I've said John Hancock a few times at this point talking about Higginson, and the reason I have is because despite their similarities and parallel career paths, Stephen Higginson and John Hancock are longtime rivals. They do not like each other. So when he gets replaced by Hancock, well, Higginson goes on the tack. You see, John Hancock had been governor of Massachusetts for quite some time. And then there were some angry farmers out west, so Hancock chooses not to run for governor again. And instead, Higginson's friend, James Bedoin, gets to the position of governor. And while James Bedoin, I believe it's Bedoin, uh, while James Bedoin is governor, well, those rowdy farmers out in western Massachusetts start Shay's Rebellion. And his friend, Governor Bedoin, has to oversee this uh, little hostility here. It's very unpopular with many people in Massachusetts because, you know, there's essentially a civil war going on within the state. It was in this environment that John Hancock decides to run for governor again. And because of this, Stephen Higginson writes a bunch of paper, uh, articles in the local papers. And these articles become known as the LACO letters. Now, the LACO letters go on the attack. They really don't like Hancock, as you might expect. And the first and foremost major argument being thrown at John Hancock by Stephen Higginson in these letters is, hey, Hancock, you were governor, and then Shades Rebellion was about to break out, and you resigned your position as governor, you let someone else deal with Shay's Rebellion, the hard part about being a governor, and now that Shay's Rebellion's taken care of, oh, here comes John Hancock just wants to get this back, doesn't he? Well, you can't just sit out the tough parts, Hancock. You gotta be there for everything. And it's, to be fair, a really good criticism, <laughs> and a lot of people at the time felt the same way. But, uh, he also attacks Hancock because Hancock's reasoning for leaving the governorship was that he, he was ill. And truth be told, Hancock did suffer from health issues, especially at this point later in his life. But Hancock left governorship because he was ill, uh, which, again, Higginson thinks he just didn't want to do the hard work. But now he's coming back? Well, Hancock, I thought you were ill. Are you? How will we know you're not just going to be ill again in the future? So are you healthy or are you not? Make up your mind. Stop flop flipping. Um, now... Oh, one last thing is Higginson actually also criticized Hancock for not serving for his lack of military service in the Revolutionary War, which is a fascinating criticism because Higginson also really didn't serve in the war. They both oversaw privateer ships, so they did essentially the same thing. Again, uh, Higginson was writing what he thought was anonymously at the time, so you could see he would be a little bit hypocritical in that particular attack. Again, he was just trying to make sure Hancock didn't get the position, didn't like Hancock very much. Fortunately for Higginson, the Lakel letters backfired because Hancock had broad popularity in Massachusetts. As you might imagine, the name Hancock still is familiar to almost every American in the world. So, uh, at the time, Hancock was very popular, and he wins in a landslide. Now, the Lakel letters did have some truth to them, but they also had many assertions that were incorrect and just, just kind of on the attack for seemingly no reason. So, uh, because of this, it seems that a lot of people who read the Lakel letters didn't know what they could or could not believe in it. Um, now, I will say, Higginson continues to hold minor offices through the rest of his career, but eventually, 15, almost 20 years later, he's associated with the Federalist Party, and he's associated with specifically people who attend the Hartford Convention. Uh, and as we've stated before, the Hartford Convention in Hartford, Connecticut, was just at the end of the War of 1812, and short story long, it was... Uh, the, the people who went were accused of trying to get New England to cede from the Union, and while that wasn't really the case, people associated with it had their careers kind of affected, and Higginson just being friends with some of the people who attended, it kind of ended his political careers. He was already an old man at that, an old man at that point, though, so Stephen Higginson uh, kind of just fades into the background of Massachusetts politics and really into the background of American history until today, where we're discussing him here. So I hope you learned a little bit about Stephen Higginson. I <laughs> no, I learned a whole lot. All right. Who's next? Mordecai Gist. Now, okay. Oh. <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Mm, talking too much, getting a scratchy throat.
from all my chat. Thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate you guys watching along with me. Let's go. Mordecai Gist. Mordecai Gist is another one of those names I know I'm mispronouncing. Uh, Mordecai, I got. Uh, his name, I believe it's pronounced Gist. I'm sure in the comments you're going to ridicule me for his name being Gist. I am not comfortable with calling him Gist. It looks like Gist to me. Again, have fun coming at me. I assure you the information I'm about to tell you is right, whether or not I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And as you can see next to me, he's Top Macaroni. And that's pretty funny, and we will get to why. But first, I have to say, Gist came from a, a moderately well-to-do family in Maryland. And after the war breaks out, during the siege of Boston, a bunch of people in Maryland get together and they say, how can we help the war effort? And they say, well, we could fight in the war. Now, these, again, are mostly younger men who are from fairly wealthy families in Maryland. So they decide to form their own company. They come together, they create what's called the Baltimore Independent Company. And the Baltimore Independent Company, since they're a volunteer company, they have to elect a leader. And they choose out of themselves Mordecai Gist as captain of the Baltimore Independent Company. So uh, Gist takes over this company, and I just want to note how how well they must have think thought of him, you know, of these people. Who among us should we choose? And they choose this young man. Now, because these people were a little bit wealthy, they actually dressed kind of well, and they had uh, nice new guns that actually had bayonets on them. Imagine that. Uh, because of this, they go up to, um, they go to meet George Washington outside of New York, and they want to participate in the, the war. So they join the, with the Continental Army, and I also, I should note that Mordecai Gist had a history with Washington. Uh, his uncle, Christopher Gist, had served in, uh, earlier battles with, alongside George Washington decades earlier, and Mordecai himself had actually studied surveying under George Washington for a brief time, though he ends up going into a merchant career instead. But these certainly help him not only secure the title he had, but give him a little bit of respect when he shows up leading the uh, the Baltimore Independent Company to the when they meet the Continental Army. Now, they see these guys showing up in their fancy outfits, and uh, people start calling them two things, Dandy and Macaroni. Now, while these names might not sound so bad today, um, it's essentially both were as if you were to look at someone today and say, call them fancy pants. Call someone fancy pants. It's not the worst insult in the whole world, but it's definitely an insult. And it's, uh, uh, I guess, what do they call them? The Mighty Ducks cake eater? <laughs> like calling someone a cake eater uh, if you, for the Mighty Ducks fans out there. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Mordecai uh, does... I do want to note, if you know the words dandy and macaroni, it might be because you know the song Yankee Doodle. I'm a Yankee Doodle dandy, blah, 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 stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. Uh, they were, that song was actually originally sung by the British to mock the Americans who were pretending to be dandies. Also, many of the American soldiers called Mordecai Gist and his men dandies and uh, macaronis, but... Uh, Yankee Doodle, as you know, would actually be appropriated by the Americans and kind of seen as an honorable thing. Now we sing Yankee Doodle Dandy as a patriotic song, and we're proud to be dandies and macaronis, uh, <laughs> uh, even though that's not originally how it was attended. And in no small part to Mordecai Gist, because not only do they show up dressed to the nines, but they show up and they're ready to fight. And their first action is at the Battle of Brooklyn. And the Battle of Brooklyn is does not go well for the Americans. And they, George Washington orders a retreat. And he has a famous line. Uh, what uh, I, and I am paraphrasing. I'm not going to be able to quote off the top of my head. But it's something along the lines of, uh, what brave men I must lose this day. And the brave men he's talking about are Mordecai Gist and his Baltimore men. At this point, they are known as the Maryland Line once they join the Continental Army. And... Historically, we now call them the Immortal 400 because Mordecai Gist leads these 400 men to defend the retreat. Their job is to hold off the overwhelming numbers being thrown at them by the British and the Hessian soldiers while the rest of the Continental Army can retreat. And they do this with extremely heavy losses. Somehow, Mordecai Gist does survive and escape. 
but most of the men under his command are killed. Most of them. And that is, again, why his men and the Baltimore line at the Battle of Brooklyn are known as the Immortal 400. And I also should note, the Battle of Brooklyn is sometimes called the Battle of Long Island and various other names. It falls under a bunch of names. It, it is an extraordinary early loss for George Washington um, and, and leaves a great impression uh, on the Continental Army in general. And they know they have to retrain uh, some of these troops, which eventually they do. Now, as for Gist, he starts making his way up the ranks. And by halfway through the war, he has risen to a brigadier general. Uh, which is an extremely important post, and he's sent down to the Southern Department. Now, un he's unfortunate where he leads men at the Battle of Camden, and though the Battle of Camden is a horrifying defeat, thanks a lot, Horatio Gates, uh, Mordecai Gist is noted as one of the leaders who actually does an outstanding job there, despite uh, what happens elsewhere on the field. Now, Gist becomes really interesting to me here because... He serves throughout the, the end of the war. He's at the victory at Yorktown. He participates in that. And then after they disband the Continental Army, he essentially retires from public life. He doesn't seem to show much interest in politics at all. He doesn't participate in the federal government in any fashion. He doesn't hold many positions of note in Maryland. Uh, he just kind of retires to his merchant firm. Now, I should note that he gives his kids arguably the most American names I've ever heard. Uh, his children are Independent Gist and States Gist. Uh, independent and States. Uh, perhaps that indicates why he wasn't a big fan of the Constitution. <laughs> he was more on the fans of States rights there. Uh, but, uh, I, I, and I do, I do believe they participated in the Civil War on behalf of the South, though I don't want to quote that. Uh, it might be States Gist's son. His name is States Rights Gist. They, they get really crazy with the names down the line in the generation. But that is, as for Mordecai Gist, again, a brigadier general in the army and the leader of the Immortal 400. So I really, uh, really hope you learned a little bit about Mordecai Gist today. I see a comment. Hi, Cindy. Uh, thank you for coming. I missed the beginning. Does his title top macaroni have a connection to Yankee Doodle Dandy's macaroni? Yes, that is. I, I did say that a little bit. Oh, got a fly in here. Uh, uh, essentially, they were... Mordecai Gist and his men were so well dressed that they, uh, Dandy and Macaroni were like calling someone Fancy Pants, or as I said, for the Mighty Ducks fans out there, a cake eater, what you might call a rich kid, uh, uh names you, and so they were basically saying they were pretending to be rich kids. Uh, and yes, Yankee Doodle Dandy was actually sung by the British making fun of the Americans at first. Uh, Mordecai Gist and his men were called Dandy and Macaroni by the Americans also. <laughs> but uh, Yankee Doodle, the song Yankee Doodle, has been reappropriated <laughs> um, by the Americans. Uh, we now think of being a Dandy and a Macaroni. Maybe not Dandy. Dandy still carries kind of the same weight as Fancy Pants. Um, but Macaroni, we no one ever uses anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've taken it and made it an honorary title. Uh, thanks in large part to Mordecai Gist and him proving that just because you're a rich boy with fancy outfits doesn't mean you can't fight to the death. Uh, yeah, no no problem, Cindy. Thank you so much for coming. You could thank me by hitting like. It's the, the best thing you can do in the whole world. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just take one sip. Talking for half an hour. Got to clear, clear the pipes. Clear the pipes. Uh, let's see, who's our next founder today? And if you're new here, uh, what I'm doing is I'm I, I publish an article every day on my website, founderoftheday.com, and this live video is going through the previous seven founders I published this week, uh, ending with today's founder in a few minutes. Uh, so definitely subscribe if you like the American Revolution. I, I put out videos all week long. We play trivia on Fridays. Come around for that tomorrow. And um, yeah, I just actually finished recording another interview with Jane, Dr. Jane Calvert, who is a John Dickinson expert. We're going to talk about the end of his life. It's, it's really fascinating. So... Definitely subscribe if you're new here. Um, thank you for coming. So, we're going to move to William Burnett. <clears throat> okay. William Burnett, no known image. <laughs> William Burnett was a Princeton graduate, which was then called the College of New Jersey, uh, and a young physician who had just recently opened up a practice. Uh, I'm sorry, not recently, had opened up a practice 25 years before the American Revolution. So he becomes a really important member of his community. And by the time the Revolutionary War breaks out, 
he gets appointed to the committee of safety despite being a physician he in the committee of safety is overseeing the war effort uh and again he's from new jersey so the militia the new jersey militia and he retains this position now after lexington and concord Burnett actually uses his own money to establish a hospital for wounded veterans. Uh, usually this kind of thing was done by the Continental Congress, but he had done it on his own. Now the Continental Congress sees him doing this and they recruit him in. Now, many physicians would go on to be surgeons for a regiment or something of that nature, but no, the Continental Army, uh, Continental Congress, I should say, brings him in as physician and surgeon general for the Eastern region. Now, this is a very long, weighted title. There's a, a, a lot of words in there, but physician and surgeon general, there were several people. He essentially was in charge of all the medical aspects between Delaware through New York in the in the mid-Atlantic there. Now there were other people who had this position in other places and there were physician and surgeon there was a physician and surgeon general above him who was the top dog at the time. But he had a lot of wounded veterans that he had to take care of. And he does this for three and a half years until the medical department gets reorganized. And then William Burnett is really disappointed to learn that he's demoted to basically a common surgeon. Now again they had reorganized there were simply less people around cat coming in happens every time um there were just less uh uh people running the medical department now he ends up resigning this position because he got a demotion and that you know these were men who cared about honor very much but just about a month later he is sent to the continental congress by his home state of new jersey now he spends a while in the in the continental congress and during this time the position as i mentioned there was the chief physician and surgeon general of the continental army was the one who oversaw all of the medical aspects including the other surgeon generals he tries to get this position unfortunately uh he does not get put in charge of the entire medical department uh james craig gets the job but he is able to replace craig in his old job by becoming chief hospital uh, uh, one of the chief hospital physicians essentially taking up his old position under a different name. Now, uh, he resigns from the Continental Congress because he wants to go do this with the army. And, you know, you weren't really supposed to be in the Continental Congress and the army at the same time. I, I don't believe it was an official rule. It was kind of an unspoken rule, especially because they were there was so much going on on both sides. So it would really be best to devote your attention to one or the other. And uh, uh, Burnett serves in this for the rest of the war and then returns to his medical practice. Now, there is one really interesting note uh, I'd like to bring up about Burnett. So we're going to go back a few years to the first year of the war. Uh, back when Burnett was overseeing the, um, uh, was one of the people on the Committee of Safety, he had a lengthy correspondence with George Washington. And in fact, when the revolutionaries take over, uh, Ben Franklin's son, William Franklin, was royal governor of New Jersey. And like the other royal governors who continued to side with the king and parliament, he had to go. So Ben Franklin's kid, William Franklin, who again is, an, is an, a man at this point, he's not a kid anymore, he's royal governor, he is actually taken as prisoner by the New Jersey Committee of Safety as an enemy of American liberties. And he is told he has to leave the state. Now he requests to be, he requ Franklin requests to be sent to Connecticut and they agree to that. However, when they sent out the guards, the people actually guarding Burnett and bring him there, they, they stop at Hackensack and they say they're going to wait there until they hear further information from General Washington. Now, unfortunately, there's not uh, a whole lot going on. And Burnett, as one of the leaders of the Committee of Safety, who are right now responsible for this high-ranking prisoner who can be exchanged for some notable Americans, uh, he's worried that William Franklin's going to escape because he's just sitting around there. So Burnett actually writes to Washington about this trou troublesome situation. And Washington says he will handle it at once. And he says a very intimidating letter to the captain of the guards, um, which is fun to read because clearly Washington is being... Uh, He's being very polite, as Washington was wont to be, but he's also, again, being very intimidating about it. And and the thing is, there's confusion because th the people overseeing William Franklin are militiamen who technically work for Burnett and not George Washington, but also technically don't because it, New Jersey's in between governments. They have the royal governor as their prisoner and the new constitution hasn't been written yet, so it's iffy. 
uh, and it doesn't really work for George Washington, but if you get a letter from George Washington saying to do something, you do it. <laughs> and that is essentially what happened, and they bring William Franklin to uh, Connecticut. And that is a brief overview of the life of William Burnett, another overlooked founder. Now, if you will permit me, I am going to step aside for one second and close this door really quick. Nope. All closed. I apologize for that. Uh, I have a cat that likes to kick open the door. Uh, and there is a fussy young man downstairs who did not nap nearly enough today because grandma and granddad came to visit. So I apologize for stepping away. Thank you for not leaving. Let's bounce over to our, <coughs> excuse me, final founder of the day, Richard Bland. Okay, I'm going to take a sip of water. Richard Bland is a lot of fun. Richard Bland. Okay. Let me pull up his stuff here. I want to keep my notes up because I'm going to screw it up if I don't. <laughs> All right. Richard Bland is your founding father's founding father. <laughs> Richard Bland was arguing against unfair taxation principles coming out of Great Britain 20 years before anyone else. I shouldn't say that. 15 years before anyone else. So Richard Bland uh, was a leader uh, a leader in Virginia well before the American Revolution. And in 1752, a full 23 years before the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, he argues for the colonists in what is called the Pistol Fee Controversy. Now, just to put some perspective on this, this is before the French and Indian War even starts. So, well before anyone was saying anything negative about Great Britain uh, or about Parliament and the king, here comes Richard Bland, again, already a Virginia leader, and he argues for the colonists in the pistol fee controversy. So, excuse me, the pistol fee controversy was the, the royal governor of Virginia had begun demanding that all land patents receive a stamp of approval, okay? So if you want to make it official, you got to go to the government and get a stamp. And the stamp cost one pistol. Now, a pistol was fairly common at the time. It equaled approximately one Spanish gold coin. And at the time, the Spanish dollar was really the dollar. Well, what the world looks at the U.S. dollar as today, at the time, that's what the Spanish dollar was considered in the Western world. It, it was the staple currency, and most other currencies were, to some degree, based around it. So one pistol is essentially one Spanish gold coin. And you needed to pay a pistol if you wanted to have a land sale. Now, Bland doesn't actually argue against the idea of having the fee itself. You know, there are licenses, even today, if you want to go hunting, you got to get a hunting license. It costs, what, like 15 bucks? Like, you know, not necessarily breaking the bank. I know not everyone's happy about it, but, you know, we pay for certain licenses. And that was the view at the time. But the problem that Richard Bland had was that the law was passed by the royal governor of Virginia and not by Virginia's colonial House of Burgesses, which was their colonial assembly. And Bland was under the impression that, well, this law doesn't affect the British Empire. It doesn't affect Parliament or the King. It only affects colonial Virginia. And therefore, you should only have the colonial legislature make this law. And he writes a response. He, he he publishes a pamphlet, and it's his first really popular pamphlet called A Fragment on the Pistol Fee. And this establishes him as a leader pro promoting colonial rights. Again, this is before the Stamp Act and before the Tea Act and before all the other intolerable acts. This is just one little law only in Virginia. And Richard Bland does not like it. And he argues that Parliament could only make laws affecting the empire, as I was saying, and it could not make laws that are internally only affect the one colony. So therefore, he is really one of the first people saying, no, Parliament does not have the right to make all laws in any and all cases. We, as British people, have the right to make our own laws and vote on our own laws, especially when it comes to our local government. Now, um, after this goes through, unfortunately, it still goes through. There is nothing he can do about it because, you know, the royal governor had the backing of the king and parliament. But either way, Richard Bland has set himself up as one of the founders. Again, 1752, like, 
Thomas Jefferson is still a child. He, Thomas Jefferson is about nine years old when this happens. John Adams is a teenager. George Washington, well, he's about 20 years old. But still, like, this, and he is a grown old grown man <laughs> making these decisions and publishing these in the papers and getting people to talk. And as these future founders are growing up in this environment and first learning about politics, Richard Bland is one of the men they are learning from. He is one of them to inspiring them to stand up for their rights as British, not just colonists, but Britons. So a few years later, in 1758, Bland was asked to write the Two Pennies Acts. So we're moving from the pistol fee controversy to what is known as the Parsons Cause. So Bland, as a member of the colonial legislature, writes the Two Penny Acts. And the Two Penny Acts changed how ministers were paid. So ministers at the time were paid in tobacco. Tobacco being a cash crop, being the way most people made their money, uh, they, the ministers, the preachers in Virginia, were paid in tobacco. Now, there was a year, 1758, where there was a terrible harvest. And they didn't think it was fair to give them this much tobacco because essentially the ministers would be making way more money than they would have had tobacco cost what it should. But because there was a poor harvest, the value of tobacco went way up. So one, if one piece of tobacco cost you 10 bucks last year, now one piece of tobacco costs you 50 bucks. Why are we giving ministers these outrageous raises? Not that ministers don't deserve a raise, but maybe this is a little bit of an extreme raise. And this became known as the Parsons Cause because when word gets back, Richard Bland brings this to uh, the House of Burgesses and they pass it and they change these rules. And then Parliament finds out and Parliament vetoes their act. Again, Parliament getting their hands in something that only affects the people of Virginia. And Bland and many other people, including a young Patrick Henry who first comes to fame not fame, fame, but first starts to make a name for himself, publicly defending Richard Bland and the Two Pennies Act. Bland himself, again, writes another pamphlet, a letter to the clergy of Virginia. A, he in, in this letter to the clergy, who are the ones getting this payment, he's insisting that the parliament has overstepped its bounds. You are, you know, your ministers, you're, you're our spiritual leaders. The fact that you will not take uh, essentially, the two pennies references the amount of money they'd be making in place of of a bushel of tobacco. If you do not take money instead of the tobacco, you are actually hurting the very people that you're supposed to be the spiritual leader for. So, come on. <laughs> Again, there's not a lot he can do about it because Parliament overrides his decision. Now... In 1765, there are more taxes passed, and the more famous ones, especially the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act was passed. Now, the royal governor of Virginia specifically prohibits anyone, any Virginia citizen from attending the Stamp Act Congress in New York City, uh, despite very specifically being told not to go to New York for the Stamp Act Congress. Richard Bland supports it. He doesn't go but he does support it. And what he does is he writes another pamphlet, probably his most famous pamphlet. In 1765, he publishes, publishes An Inquiry into the Rights of the British Colonies. And in, in, in an inquiry to the rights of British colonies, uh, he takes his position even farther. And at this point, he goes, he, he doesn't just say the British have no right to tax things that don't affect the empire. He actually starts to argue that Parliament has no right to tax the colonies without their consent whatsoever. So uh, just to reiterate, he had been saying the Parliament can't get involved when it's just us deciding internal taxes. Now he's saying Parliament has no right to tell us what we can or can't get taxed on if we don't get to vote ourselves. Now, there are many founders who get credit for creating the slogan, no taxation without representation. While Richard Bland never actually said that, he can arguably be the person, at least in Virginia, who really first starts arguing for the idea 
of no taxation without representation. Again, he didn't come up with the slogan. And, and to be fair, this is about the same time James Otis has begun saying things like this up in Massachusetts. And, and James Otis usually gets the credit for saying no taxation without representation. But here we are. We have Bland arguing for just that. And he's one of the first people in Virginia doing this. And again, as I said, he's already had uh, an influence on uh, Patrick Henry's early career. And by this point, by the time he published this, he's already meeting with Thomas Jefferson is finally grown up now and starting to attend the House of Burgesses and, and, and dozens of other founders become friendly with George Washington, Richard Henry Lee. They all look up to this now older man who has been arguing for 20 years against injustices when it comes to taxation coming out of Parliament. Now, he does actually go, Richard Bland goes to the First Continental Congress and signs the Continental Association. So he is himself a founder. He even goes to the Second Continental Congress. However, unfortunately, due to ill health, uh, he leaves before the debates on independence and does not vote for or against independence. He returns home, um, though he does return to the Virginia House of Delegates. And he is among the group of people in the Virginia, of Virginians who uh, resolve, who who send instructions to the Continental Congress to resolve that, quote, these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, end quote. Uh, fortunately for Bland, because he's involved with this, it does indicate he may very well have voted for independence had he stuck around in the Constitution and in the Continental Congress. Um, unfortunately, like I said, he was older at this point and in very ill health. So he does just barely live long enough to see independence declared. And he does get the, uh, how do you say, uh, 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 respite of seeing his nation become independent after almost a quarter a century of arguing against the garbage taxes being sent to Virginia from Parliament. He finally gets to see Virginia in a situation where they can make their own taxes. Granted, he passes away, doesn't see the federal government come around 15 years later, where, you know, the federal government could make some taxes for Virginia, too. But that is a discussion for another day where we'll talk about anti-federalists like we do every Friday. I hope you learned a little bit about Richard Bland. He's a fascinating character in the American founding. As I said at the outset here, he is the founding father's founding father. Uh, many of the Virginian founders learned about why they should be unhappy with certain taxes coming from Great Britain from him in the decades leading up to revolution. So. That is the story of Richard Bland. And that's our final founder today. Uh, I'll pull myself back up. I think I get a little louder when I pull up this screen for some reason. Don't know why. Uh, for those of you who have been watching, thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys coming. Uh, as always, if there's any questions or comments, I am here for you. Uh, uh, Misfit, I did put on the Discord uh, some John Paul Jones recommendations I had gotten from uh, uh, Michael Troy over at the Amherst Podcast. Definitely check him out. Uh, I would like to give a big thank you to all my patriots on Patreon who have been sort of supporting the channel. Uh, I've also started accepting donations on PayPal. So there are uh, several people have come through in the past two weeks and, and give, helped a lot offset some of the costs. Believe it or not, there are expenses incurred uh, running the website and all this. So if you guys could help in any way, that is gigantically appreciated. The number one thing you could do for me, though, is when you're on your way out, hit like. If you hit like, more people see this, uh, and we can build a bigger community, and we can all learn about the American Revolution together. So that is it for me this week. Thank you guys tremendously for taking the time to come hang out. Um, I will be back with trivia for you tomorrow. So make sure you come, because we have to get those 243 names. We will do it. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, subscribe. Come on Friday, 815 Trivia. It's a lot of fun. With that... Today is the wrap-up, which is round bottom. So, thank you so much. From the top of my heart, round bottom.